my enlightened children. The day of ascension is upon us. The machine god and the chaos deities prove false to their worshippers. Only us, we who combine the alien, the machine, and humanity have reached true perfection. There will be resistance to us stepping into the role of true planetary leader, but that confirmation of our rightness will make our ascension all the sweeter. It is said that with these words, Magos Diestix launched the coup that would seize a world for the gene stealer cult. It failed, and almost everybody died. With his bodyguard Ingresh, more commonly known as Big Hammer Lady, by my opponents, though whether the hammer, the lady, or both are the big part, they don't say. These two and a few dozen others, they escaped the subsequent genocide, but were entirely disillusioned. This is how the law of one such gene stealer cult goes. They tried to overthrow their chaos cult masters from the Night Lords, and failed. This is the law I have written for my army. Before I talk about the rules for Gene Steel Occult in 10th edition, let's look more at the background to the faction. That is what fascinated me decades ago. The generations that make up the units of the Gene Steel Occult and how it starts. Do you like the film Alien? Then this is the army for you. So it starts when a Gene Stealer loves a human very much, when a single Gene Stealer gets to a planet. They find a human and they hypnotize them. They then use their ovipositor to deposit some genetic information into the host. This is known as the gene stealer kiss. The infected person wants to then have children and spread knowledge of this newfound religion. They go about that in the usual way with someone else, and the first child they have, and only the first one, is a gene stealer hybrid. Any other children fall under the hypnosis and become brood brothers, loyal to the cult. In the campaign books The Shield of Baal, the spawn of Cryptus, which was a big bad in those books, was the older brother of a planetary governor. The planetary governor's mother had given birth to a gene stealer, which then grew into this patriarch. Except at the time, gene stealer cult weren't really supported, so this was a Broodlord, which is the Tyranid equivalent for their army, but it has very similar stats. It took a lot of mental energy for the planetary governor to resist the pull of the hive mind. In the books, he was portrayed as weak, but really, it takes a lot of mental power to overcome a patriarch's psychic influence when he's right next to you the whole time. Any children born of someone hypnotized and implanted by a gene stealer are first generation hybrids. Horrifying looking creatures with three arms, at least one of them being a claw, similar to what the gene stealers themselves have. When they have children, this creates a second generation hybrid, looking a little bit more human, but not really. They also have three arms, one of which again is probably a claw, though it may be smaller than with the first generation. Their children are third generation. Very strange looking, bulbous heads, but only two arms, and so in theory, they can pass for human, at least in shape. So if they're covered under a void suit or something like that, then they can look pretty normal. Their children again are fourth generation hybrids. These can pass for human. They have a small ridged crest on their head and are naturally bald, but these can be covered up by wearing, you know, some kind of hat. So they can pass for human in pretty much every circumstance. It is from the fourth generation that we also get specialists like the Magos, the psychic leader of the cult, besides the patriarch themselves. And that patriarch was that first gene stealer, grown strong from all of the offerings of meat and food, and also the psychic support that is getting from all of the others in the brood mind. Now the children of the fourth generation, you'd think, well, what are they? Are they humans? No, they then create pure strain gene stealers, and the cycle has gone full circle. These gene stealers are Tyranids, and they too can be sent off to other worlds and colonies and different parts of a planet to begin the cycle anew. Isn't life beautiful? 
Further details on this aren't really known. I mean, what happens if you have a second generation hybrid breed with a fourth generation hybrid? Is that a pure stain gene stealer or is it a third generation hybrid? And I don't mean someone with their own like grandparent because generations appear at different times. You might have cycles of 20 years and a similar cycle next to it of 30 years, so they could be the same age. And that is why all gene stealer cults will have a mix of first, second, third, fourth generation hybrids, provided they've been allowed to persist for that long. The whole cycle only really works on humans. The orcs are more flora than fauna. That's how orc spores work. Did you kill all the orcs in one place and not burn the bodies? Because that's how you get more orcs. Little spores come off them, grow into funguses, and those funguses create orcs. You might be able to get a first generation hybrid, but that is about it. And the drive to be an orc is stronger than the pull of the brood mind. So all you really get is a mech boy who has an unfair advantage in appendages and wants to build orc walkers with four arms. But this isn't about orcs. This video is about orcs. You have to click away in the top right, just clicking the image pauses the video. I'll wait for you to come back. Okay, anyway. The Eldar are too psychically aware of each other to fall under the Broodmind spell, and the Tau now supposedly have genetic screening to remove Gene Stealer cult DNA. For the Space Marines, a Gene Stealer's kiss doesn't affect a Space Marine's gene seed, so they're another faction of the 40k universe that's completely immune. And even among the humans, a Gene Stealer cult can be rumbled by the Ordo Xenos, who are expert at hunting Gene Stealer cult. Local enforcers, gang disputes can all bring the Gene Stealer cult to the surface prematurely, as it did on Terra. But if Gene Stealer cults are really quiet and pay their taxes and meet their high work quotas and be friendly, then the Inquisition shows up, feeling very sure that something must be up. There are a lot of playstyles for the Gene Stealer cult army. We have dirt bikes, we have religious peasant horde, we have monster menagerie. Spicy Imperial Guard, and Cowboy Gunslingers. In the most recent range update, Games Workshop seemed to be running out of ideas for them. Other armies got full model reworks, squig monsters, vehicles, and we got a character unit that was a DJ. Whichever style you play, for all of them, you are the underdog. You have to play smart and use your specialists and shock troops carefully while sacrificing the other troops. Not hoping to hurt the enemy, but hoping to distract the enemy. There are more disadvantages. Your troops will die to basically any other in a straight up fight. You absolutely have to outthink your opponent and plan it all for one good turn to carry you through the rest of the battle. You absolutely cannot think of it in terms of trading units but in isolating enemy units and wiping them out with no losses to your own, very fragile, very expensive units. With board sizes getting bigger, this should be a little easier to do. Ha <laughs> ha ha. The Gene Stealer cult use ambush tactics. While part of the army is distracting, the other part is waiting underground beneath the city, ready to strike at the enemy. Part of the struggle for Gene Stealer cult in 8th edition was having to make a lot of 9 inch charges when you come up from reserve. This is below average for a 2d6. In 9th edition, Gene Stealer Cult were given the chance to arrive 8 inches away and so have an average chance to charge. Good luck. Or you could be 6 inches away from enemies and shoot but not charge. This made it hard for opponents to screen them out and if you were smart, you would pick off several isolated enemy units before you regroup to have a go at the remainder of the opposing forces oppressing you. Don't think that just because Gene Steel Occult were at the top of the pack in tournaments before the last 9th edition update that they were easy to play. They had simple secondaries. Well, simpler. Like scoring points for being alive on the board. Actually, that ends up being harder when you spend the first turn part off the board and part standing still and dying. As for the advantages of playing Gene Steel Occult... Um... Have I mentioned that the law is cool? Also, if you picked up the Games Workshop special dice for Gene Steel Occult, they always roll a 7, because they have clear plastic through the top and the bottom, so you can see both numbers at once. They're very expensive online, because of how obviously OP they are when playing the game. 
Like with the Battle Sisters, not a lot of people play them because they haven't had much support in the background lore and they have a very small model range. They are also very hard to play and have such a different playstyle that actually opponents won't be expecting it. That is your advantage. Your opponent is unlikely to understand how your rules work. That doesn't mean cheat, it just means you always have the element of surprise until you play that same person a second time, then you get crushed. Okay, let's look at some of the rules for how they play in 10th edition. We die. That's the army special rule. More so than Battle Sisters. I'm getting worried about some of the rules right as a games workshop. So many rules about dying for the cause. I do hope their staff are not overworked to the point of being mind broken. So, the Gene Stealer cult now gets units back, not just models. We still have Summon the Cult, which was the 9th edition rule on the icons, and so we play a lot like the Necrons, getting models back each turn, and more models if you are on an objective. So you can have fun doing a battle of attrition against the Necrons of all creatures. This makes the Gene Stealer Cult Neophytes very hard to remove from an objective, and on a 2 plus, I know it says add 3 and it's a 4 plus roll, but I'm pretty sure 1 is always a failure still, right? So on a 2+, plus, they come back and can go for a less defended objective far on the other side of the board. You also get command points from being on an objective. Remember just one per turn can be generated like this. Uh, but this addition is nicely leaning into being an objective focused game, where there are genuine rewards beyond the victory points for controlling the objectives. Good job on Games Design Games Workshop. Your workshop of games continues. To fight Gene Stealer Cult, you'll have to clump up on the objectives and do your best to screen them out. Except for using a fast unit or two to rush around and hoover up those cult ambush markers before they are revealed at the end of the Oppressor. That's what we call opponents of the Gene Stealer Cults. Before they are revealed at the end of the Oppressor's movement phase. That will stop some Gene Stealer Cult units coming back. Unless there's a stratagem that we haven't seen that lets you put another token on the board to bring back one of those units that's already in Cult Ambush. Well, as part of all of their data sheets, every single Gene Stealer Cult Infantry unit has Deep Strike. So they are coming on from 9 inches away, like in 8th edition. Well, everything's being toned down a bit. Except, you know, demons can still deploy 6 inches away with their detachment rules. And the Grey Knights have a teleport ability that lets them jump around. How odd that these two factions play very similar. Except, you know, demons have their invulnerable save, and Grey Knights are now improved to have a 2 plus save on their most basic troops, which does make sense for their fancy artificer armor. Goes in with a whole super elite thing. More than Space Marines. Better than Space Marines, just more toned down psychic things, which we're also seeing for the Gene Stealer Cult. But we can talk a little bit more about that when I move on to the actual units. And there's also a stratagem that the Gene Stealer Cult have to make their reserves better. So we're not coming in from 9 inches. Again, I'll talk about that in a minute. As for the rules that are not here, there's no crossfire. Well, there is for a 2 command point stratagem to get plus 1 to wound on 2 units. And it lasts for more than just the shooting phase. So you can do an actual combat only Gene Stealer Cult army. You no longer need to have any of the daft lines drawn between the units and a number of hits scored and things. One page worth of rules for this one thing was a lot, and I never liked it. But we've lost secret deployment, which was again a pain. You would put down tokens instead of deploying your units while your opponent is deploying units. Then if you went first, you then have to take all those tokens off and put your units on the board. Or if your opponent goes first, they do their movement phase. And then you take all your tokens off the board and put your units on the board in their place. It was just a time consuming thing and I'm glad that it's gone. As for limiting the character numbers, we're not seeing that particularly for Gene Sect. The Lookout Sir, through unquestioning loyalty, again I don't think it'll be needed. It'll just be that characters within a bodyguard unit, they can be protected until, you know, the bodyguard is all dead. Or the enemy brings some horrifying precision weapons. All of the ambush ability upgrades, they are gone, as far as we know. The enhancements haven't really been shown off, but it's looking like three enhancements for your army that get to go on characters and no more than one enhancement per character. 
What about the other, 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 other rule that the Gene Stealer cult had? Brood Brothers. Being able to include some Imperial Guard, even though they are completely different sub-factions and factions and overall fight for entirely different groups. Well, yes. Like what we saw with the Chaos Demons, 25% of your points can be spent on allies like the Brood Brothers. They won't get their Born Soldiers ability, and they lack the keywords to use Gene Stealer Cult stratagems and return as a new wave, but they can bring on a Lehman Russ battle tank. So that makes up for it. As for the units that the Gene Stealer Cult are bringing themselves, well, for the Neophytes, quite a lot of their weapons have changed. The Weber is short of range and needs to roll a 6 to wound to do anything. Previously, you had to roll above the enemy strength. Since strength isn't a characteristic that appears anymore, this works. Fair enough. The leader gets a generic pistol, whether it's an auto pistol, bolt pistol, or web pistol. The seismic cannon now only has one fire mode, which is more like its heaviest profile, but with decent range. The shotguns and auto guns have all been merged together and called firearms, just like the Chaos Cultists have had. And I just finished painting up two separate units of Gene Stealer Cult Neophytes, one with shotguns, one with auto guns. Why does this keep happening? Is it just me? It's probably just me. Other weapons getting merged are the leaders Pick and Maul. They're now just one thing. But I would take the Chainsword. Consider the Chainsword. Twice the attacks. Yes, two attacks. But that is more attacks to benefit from special rules, like sustained hits from this detachment ability. So those two attacks can become even more attacks. And then we have the Heavy Stubber, which I talked about when I mentioned all of the Imperial Guard stuff. It is Ballistic Skill 4+, plus and isn't heavy. So it doesn't matter if you stay still or not, you can move and fire this now, with no penalty to the Ballistic Skill. And you get 6 shots at half range, and then with the sustained hits when you've just come out from reserve, Ooh, yes please! I'll take that over a one-shot mining laser. I think for this edition, shooting and weight of fire will be the key to victory. Okay, the Patriarch. The big one. The one that started it all. Well, we've dropped a wound and an attack, and we're still the relatively low Toughness 5. You'll notice that he's an epic hero, so you can only include one of them in your army. That gets around the previous Broodfather rule, where you could only include one Patriarch and it had to be the leader. Notice that the Claws are twin-linked, so you still get to reroll your wound rolls for them. It's gained Infiltrate, so you can deploy him anywhere on the board that's more than 9 inches from an enemy unit or the enemy deployment zone. And because he doesn't have the Cult Ambush faction special rule, you won't get a second one if he dies. I expect none of the characters will have this ability, that will be how the gene sect works with like only one of each type. Yes, so I'm afraid only one DJ per cult. For its psychic powers, it has cosmic horror, which means at the start of the fight phase each enemy unit within six must take a battle shock test. Or you can double its range once per battle with the familiar. Running in and just being a fear bomb could just be a tactic. You may not survive all of the enemies going after you after that, and as long as you're not playing narratively, then yeah, rush in, scare the enemy off an objective. Doesn't matter how it goes after that. The enemy won't be able to control the objectives and win the mission. This is why I think it'll be a good unit to put with the Acolyte Hybrids, who have objective control too. That is, if the Patriarch can be with Acolyte Hybrids. Then you've got the ability to scare the enemy off the objectives, and you've got the bodies to control the objective after that. The one big thing he's lost is the ability to advance and charge. That was always like a haha surprise zoom patriarch. And we don't know if the gene stealers for the gene stealer cult will be battle line. Probably not, because Games Workshop hates to have the idea of gene stealer cults having effective gene stealers. They also haven't shown off the gene stealer data sheet for the gene stealer cult, so here's the one for the Tyranids. Two wounds and a 5 plus invulnerable save, instead of one wound and a 4 plus invulnerable save that the Gene Stealer cult Gene Stealers get at the moment. I'm saying Gene Stealer so much it's going to be messing up the captions at some point. So we don't know if they will have the ability to advance and charge that was their mainstay. Looking at this though, they will probably just get the infiltrate rule like the Patriarch does and leave scouting to the Gene Stealers that go with the Tyranids. The Gene Stealer Claws don't have devastating wounds, the thing that they were known for, you know, they were the rending claws. 
And we know that they don't even in the Gene Stealer Cult version because Games Workshop has said you can pair them with the Patriarch to then get devastating wounds for the unit. The other units in the Gene Stealer Cult army that we know of, the Reductus Saboteur, I would assume would have Lone Operative. Her rules in 9th edition were basically a very wordy version of Lone Operative and Stealth, so she couldn't be shot if the enemy was more than 12 inches away, and if anyone did, then they were minus one to hit her if she was within area terrain. Her bombs are now indirect fire, which makes sense. Before she had to poke her head out to check when someone was approaching one of her bombs before detonating them. On average, she gets more of a blast, but loses a point of ballistic skill. And of course, another minus one if she can't see her target when she pushes the boom button. And the charges have lost all three of their AP and three strength. Now I'm wondering how many other units will get the demo charges like this. Having it on a disposable acolyte squad would be great. Run in and throw it for some really high strength nastiness. Now Big Hammer Lady. Big Hammer Lady's Big Hammer is about the same as before, but now it's doing between 2 and 7 damage instead of the previous 4 to 6 damage, and it loses a point of armor penetration. Fine. Still only 3 attacks, which was always her drawback, but sustained hits remember when coming from reserve with this detachment rule. The Locus confers fight first on its bodyguard unit, and the Biophagus, which maybe can only go with Aberrants, we don't know yet, confers lethal hits, so that's why you'll be getting a lot more attacks, just going straight through the enemy toughness. You can add these characters that were previously elites into units that are already led by characters that were previously HQ, like the Magos and the Primus. As for the stratagems, Remember, Rapid Ingress from the core rulebook will be a go-to to get those charges. You don't want to be relying on rolling a 9, instead deploy after the enemy has moved, so that as long as you're out of line of sight, you're not going to get shot, you can move up in your turn and have a much easier charge. Then we have Tunnel Crawlers, that let you come up 3 inches away and not charge the enemy. That is perfect for those demolition charges I mentioned. So this is much like the 9th edition version where you could arrive 6 inches away, but not charge. It costs a command point now, but with the shorter range you can actually use grenades and demolition charges. If this is a way to analyse a faction that you liked, there is a subscribe button. Just saying. Let's see now how right I was when I talked about the Gene Stealer cult two weeks ago. My darlings and viewers, have a great day on Ascension Day!